السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So inshallah we're going to be speaking about dua and dua is the weapon of the believer it is something that no one can stop you from doing at any time at any given moment you can make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal it can be done anywhere it can be done anytime whether you're in a state of tahara or not and during times of peace during times of war during times of difficulty during times of ease in sujood while you're standing while you're sitting while you're laying down and the greatest thing is that no one can ever stop you from making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we'll begin with a, a question that the companions asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they said they're asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala close to us فَنُنَاجِي He's close to us so that we can speak to him meaning and almost like whisper and speak softly to him or is he far فَنُنَاجِي that we have to yell out to him and call out to him and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala responds to this question and we know the ayat that are speaking about dua Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ And if my servants ask you concerning me, I am close to them, I respond to the caller or the supplication of the caller when he calls upon me. طيب. We all know this verse, but it's really amazing if you contemplate the way this verse is worded and phrased. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many times the companions or even the Jews would come and ask the Prophet a question and then he would say, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ They ask you about, قُلْ Say, and he gives him the answer sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ They ask you about الرُّوح, قُلِ الرُّوح مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي Say, the ruh is from my Lord. So now, they ask you about a question, they ask you about a question, say to them this. But when it comes to dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worded it in a very different way. He didn't say if they ask you or when they ask you. He said when my servant ask you about me. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي Then he doesn't say قُلْ tell them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعْنِ Which is really amazing. I am close. The response comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. With no قُلْ, with no go and convey this or that. Why? To show us how close he is subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to dua. And subhanallah, despite this magnificent wording and the way this ayah is worded, people still make effort and go a long distance to make dua to Allah through someone else. Someone who is dead in a grave somewhere far away and they take the bus or they take their car all the way to that person. Well, Allah said to them, I'm close. And he said it to them directly himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the benefit of seeing the fact that you're close to Allah, that you can ask Allah Azza wa Jal at any given time, at any given moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, ask me and I will respond to you. I will answer your dua. Ask me and I will answer. اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Istijaba, the response to your dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا And to Allah are the, the, the most sublime names. So ask them using these names. We see another great hadith. This hadith is a sahih hadith narrated in the book of At-Tirmidhi. Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه, he says قال صلى الله عليه وسلم مَنْ لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ مَنْ لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ Whoever doesn't ask Allah, Allah will be angered with him. Is this amazing or what? Whoever doesn't ask Allah, Allah will be angered with him. Allah will be angry with you if you don't ask him. You have to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. You should ask Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you don't ask him, this, doesn't this show you how generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? That if you don't ask him, he's angered with you. And if you ask him a thousand times, ten thousand times, he doesn't become angered because you asked him. And this is not how human beings are, correct? If someone, human being asks you something and they keep asking you what happens after a while, what happens to you when someone keeps asking you a question? 
So you tell someone I'm going to the bookstore. What do you need? Get me this book. Okay, khair, inshallah. Taib, could you get, make sure you get me that book, please? Huh? Oh, taib, khair. And just don't forget, get me the book. Taib. Inshallah, I'll get you the book. I'm going in a little bit. Two minutes later, yeah, get me the book, okay? Yeah, don't get me the book. Taib. Make sure you get me that book. I'll send you a text right now so you don't forget to get me the book. What happens after a little bit? Khalas, yeah, I'm not going to the bookstore. Yalla, huh? Forget it. You get angered, but not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't liken Allah to His creation. But Allah Azza wa Jal is so generous that if you don't ask Him, He gets upset. Some people, even if they're generous, if you don't ask them, Alhamdulillah, I'll give it to someone else or whatever. But Allah Azza wa Jal, you, you don't ask Him and He gets angered with you. Another great hadith in Sahih al-Tirmidhi, yani in the book of al-Tirmidhi and Sunan Abu Dawood as well. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ad-du'a huwa al-ibadah. Basically, the hadith means that dua, supplication, is the essence of worship. The essence of worship. And in another hadith, afdalu al-ibadah ad-du'a. The, the best of ibadah is dua. The best of ibadah is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad, and it is sahih as well as narrated by Salman al-Farisi, where the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيِّيٌّ كَرِيمٌ يعني Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, حَيِّي, what does it mean حَيِّي? يعني يَسْتَحِي, which means what? يعني we don't have an exact word, but يَسْتَحِي is a combination of being shy, being bashful, being modest, a combination of that. Type. Where is this hadith going to go? How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens of the earth, be حَيِّي, have haya from someone? Who is this individual? What is the situation where Allah Azza wa Jal, the master of the heavens and the earth, is going to have haya in a situation. In Allah hayyun kareem, generous. Yastahi ida rafa al rajulu ilayhi yadeh an yarud an yaruddahuma sifran khaibatain. Yani Allah subhanahu wa taala yastahi. He yani he he has this haya if ida rafa al rajul if the man lifts up and of course hadith like this will apply to the woman automatically if a man puts his hands up. Okay, puts his hands up, that they will return empty-handed. Yani if a man puts his hands up, Allah hates that your hands return empty-handed. That means Allah will definitely give you something or somewhere or at some time. You will definitely get something because Allah is shy that you, you put your hands up and you return them without Him giving you something. And if they told you there was a human like this, you go to Him and there's no way you go back home empty-handed. Wallahi, there will be lines and lines and lines in front of his home. Lines in front of his home. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like this. And so when you hear a hadith like this, what is your conclusion? What do you do? You know, haya, what haya does when, when, you, when you have haya and you give, like sometimes a person might come to you and you know they're lying. And they're lying to you and it's clear they're lying. <laughs> Their story is messed up, full of holes. They look like a liar. Their face says, I'm lying. And you know they're lying. And what do you do? You still give them. Why? Because of haya. You, you felt shy and ashamed and a little too shy to send them away. So you give them. You understand? Someone is lying to you and you know they're lying or you know they're a liar in the community. But out of haya, they came into your home and they asked you, could you please? Yani, khairan, wallahi. You know when people swear a lot what that means. Yeah? Wallahi al-azim, I tell you. Wallahi, keep swearing. And wallahi, I'm not lying. Tabi akhi, who accused you of lying? Because you're a liar, you're saying that. And you know they're lying, but because of haya, you give them. Because of your, your shame and shy now to, not, to let them turn out or go out of your home empty handed. So you give them something. Yeah. We don't liken Allah to His creation. But imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also hates. So this person here lied to you and you still gave them because of this haya. So far be it from someone to feel because of their sins also, Allah won't give me because I committed sins. No. Allah hates that your hands are turned down empty handed. Your hands drop down with Allah not giving you anything. Even if you sin, He'll give you. Just like that person lied and the generous man on earth gave him. You sin and He'll still respond to you and He'll still give you khair. So then why is it that the dua would be delayed then? Why doesn't Allah give people immediately? People put their hands up and they get it immediately since Allah hates for your hands to go down empty handed. And that can be with a wisdom that, is, that remains with Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. Could be with the wisdom that remains with him. And sometimes by delaying this act of worship, the person, or de delaying the dua, or the response of the dua, the person's life will change. The person's life will completely change. That they sinned against Allah Azza wa Jal, and now they keep making dua, or they have a problem in their life, and they keep asking Allah for it. In this process, and in the time it took to the, the, the dua to be responded to, perhaps it was two months. In these two months, this person will completely change because they're in dire need of Allah Azza wa Jal. So what do they do in these two months? In these two months, they fast every other day. They get up and play, pray in the last third of the night. They make long sujood. They pray with khushu'. They're always making dhikr of Allah, always making istighfar, staying away from things that are haram, staying away from saying things that are haram, looking at things that are haram because at time of, at time of calamity, you get close to Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah might delay it enough so that this becomes part of this person's lifestyle now. He, his life completely changes. He makes tawbah and he becomes a better person. And wallahi brothers, just yesterday, wallahi yesterday, I met a brother in another city and he was telling me, and he didn't tell me the details. He said he committed a sin and his life is miserable because of the sin. But he's telling me how he's constantly, constantly making dua and dhikr and qiyam and all kinds of things. So in the end, if he would just realize that, that sin, look, it was a bad thing, but look at all the khair that came to you as a result of it. Perhaps if you didn't commit that sin, you would still be doing what you used to do, not praying, not caring about the deen. So we trust in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We trust in the wisdom of Allah azza wa jal. So that's why possibly sometimes a dua might be delayed. Allah will not give it to you instantly. And the idea isn't for you to get it instantly like that. So what if then I ask Allah Azza wa Jal and I put my hands down and Allah hates that my hands are returned empty and then nothing happens. Months, maybe even years, nothing happens. So where does this response go? Where does it go? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explained it goes to one of three possible places. Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Imma an yani Either, it's one of three places. One, it's given to him in this dunya. He's asking, oh Allah, I ask for this, and it's given to him. Either the next week, or the next day, or in a year, but he's given what he wanted, what he asked for, Allah gives it to him in this dunya. And that's one way the dua is answered. Another way, Or that Allah will push away some kind of evil with this dua that they used to make, that they would make. So some kind of evil was coming towards this person. But because of the dua, it was pushed away. And it could be another type of harm, or it could be a worse harm. Because the Nabi ﷺ also said in the famous hadith, لا يرد القدر إلا الدعاء The only thing that will turn away the qadr, the decree of Allah, is dua. So someone, for example, the decree was he will get, let's say, والعياذ بالله, may Allah protect all of you, let's say cancer at age 35 or something. And this man, from age 27, he's, Ya Allah, give me good health. Ya Allah, keep diseases away from me. Ya Allah, give me good health. So then this dua, this, this, this illness that was coming to him at age 35, it's, it meets with his dua. They clash. And it sends away the qadr, the decree. It sends away the bad decree. The problem is, brothers, is that we are not foresighted when it comes to these things. Allah Azza wa knows the future. And in the end, he gives us what is good for us. Because a lot of times you make dua, and maybe you're asking for something that's not good for you. And you don't know the future. You think it's good for you. And I think every single one of us in this room has experienced that before. Where in the past you were asking for something, and maybe five, six years later you realize, Alhamdulillah, Allah didn't respond to my dua. Because if he would have responded to my dua, it would have taken me down a path in my life that I would never get out of. I think every single one of us has an experience like that, correct? Fine. So, Allah Azza wa knows that when you're asking Him, ultimately, what do you want for yourself? You want khair for yourself. So if there's no khair in this item, Allah will push it away from you. It's that simple. So, but we said the foresightedness. And if to people, for people, if they could only realize what possible or potential other good happened. So a man, for example, his father is ill. And he keeps making dua for his father. Keeps making dua for six years, seven years. His father is still ill and he's not cured. The problem is that we are impatient. So this person will complain. I've been asking Allah to cure my father for seven years and Allah hasn't cured him. They become impatient. But if they were foresighted, 
perhaps your father was going to die six years ago. But because of your dua, Allah extended his life. Taban in the end, what it means? What do we mean? Ex extended his life, meaning ultimately Allah in in Lauh al Mahfuz had decreed that because of your dua, and it's known that because of your dua, he was going to be his life will be extended another six years. This person, Allah has been so generous to him. He left his father remain alive for six years. These six years where his father remained alive were expiation for his sin. He got to see his family. They got to enjoy their time with him and meet him and laugh with him. He got to see his grandchildren. So, but the person is impatient. Allah did him such a great blessing and a favor, and yet he's impatient. I have been asking Allah for seven years, and look, my father's still ill. If he only knew. Six years ago he was going to die, but your dua kept him for another six years. If only we can be foresighted like that. Or someone will keep making dua to Allah, Ya Allah, help me re relieve me of my debts. Ya Allah, relieve me of my debts. And for years his debts are right there. Five years his debts are right there. So the person says, what is this? Yani I asked Allah Azza wa Jal, this is the impatient person. And this is the person with no foresight, and this is the person with little trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. I asked Allah for five years, and my debt still remained as is. But subhanAllah, perhaps your debt would have increased, and Allah kept it as is. Some people, their debts increase over the years. Your debt didn't increase because of your dua. Or some people, they have debts with people, and your debtor is impatient. And they always come and knock on your door. And every time you see them, you know, you want to change the street and you, don't, you want to escape from their eyesight, from their sight. And Allah made your debtors patient because of your dua. So instead of hounding you and knocking on your door constantly, they don't bother you. They might meet you and say, take your time. So you're thinking my, my debts are still there. But Allah answered your, your dua by keeping the debtor patient with you. Or by not having them increase these debts. If only... We could be foresighted. So, or it could be anything else. Yani it could be that someone is asking Allah, he's really in need of a thousand pounds, and he keeps asking Allah for a thousand pounds, and he doesn't get the thousand, but Allah averts or pushes away another harm that would have cost him more than that, or could have cost him eight or seven times more than that. Or another issue, so perhaps he's still in need of the thousand, but Another illness was pushed away from him. Another terminal illness was pushed away from him. And this person, instead of being thankful and trusting that in the end this dua went somewhere, is angered and not satisfied. So then that means the dua, could, you make a dua and the answer can be given to you and you might get what you wanted right here in the dunya. Or perhaps you don't get exactly what you wanted, but some similar harm or a greater harm is pushed away because of your dua. Or the third thing, it's given to you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, on the Day of Resurrection. So on the Day of Resurrection, and everyone knows their deeds, their pile of good deeds is in front of them, and their small bad deeds, inshallah, are in front of them. And suddenly they get mountain, a mountain of good deeds added to their good deeds. Type, where did I get this mountain from? Where is this from? And it is told, these are all the du'as that you made in the dunya that were not, that were not responded to. All the, every dua, al-ad'iyah that you made in the dunya that were not responded to, now you're getting them pure gold now. You're getting them in good deeds added to your scale on the day of judgment. And you know the value of one hasana on the day of resurrection. So, what, the person, what will happen? What will be the reaction of people when they get all the dua that was unanswered in the dunya? What will they wish for? They will wish, I wish none of my dua was, was ever responded to in the dunya. See, in that world, in the next life, they have better understanding. In this life, we want things, we want to be comfortable in this dunya, we want things to, be, our dua to be responded to, and so on and so forth. But in the next life, they'll see the value of this dua that is not responded to at coming as good deeds. And they will wish that every single dua they made in the dunya would not have been answered, just so they can get them in the akhirah. So that means then, you're, it's a win-win situation. You never lose when you make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. You never lose. It's a win-win situation. The companions radiallahu anhum were magnificent people. And when they understood this concept, they just said something simple. They said a simple phrase that shows they truly understood it. They said, إِذَنْ فَلْنُكْثِرْ إِذَنْ فَلْنُكْثِرْ If that's the case, 
if it's as you described, Ya Rasulullah, where it goes to one of these three places and every one of them is a benefit, either I get what I want, that's great, or I get a, some, some worse harm or a similar harm pushed away and that's w wonderful, or I get it all on the Day of Judgment and I'll be so happy and even more pleased with it on the Day of Judgment, then we should make a lot of dua. Idhan, falnukthir. And the Prophet ﷺ, when they said that, he said, Allahu Akbar. That's it. He was pleased that they got it so well. And this is the same concept that we understand. So are we going to nukthir? Are we going to now excel and excess in making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal or not? Now, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the istijaba, when Allah responds to your dua, there's a difference between the, the qubul and tanfeeth. Yani when Allah accepts your dua is one thing, and the tanfeeth, the, the dua actually happening, is a, or the response actually coming, is a different thing. Musa and Harun, alayhim as -salam, they made dua to Allah, both of them together, they're making dua, and Harun saying, Ameen, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I accept your dua. And when did it happen? 20 years after that date. The Prophet ﷺ made dua against some of the leaders of the Quraysh. And when the dua was accepted, the qubul came. But when is it going to be implemented? Years later on after the Battle of Badr. This dua was made in Mecca. And these people were killed in the Battle of Badr. It came years later. So Allah might accept your dua, but not do it or implement it immediately. And that is with the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal and due to the wisdom of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. We don't dictate when something happens. That is up to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is showing us ways to make dua so that it will be responded to by Allah Azza wa Jal. Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. Make dua to Allah while you are certain of the response. And you, you're sure that Allah will yastajib, that will re, He will respond to you. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ يعني دُعَاءً مِنْ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ لَاهٍ And know that Allah does not respond to a dua from a heart that is غَافِل يعني heedless and occupied with something else. Allah does not accept a dua from a heart that is heedless, occupied with something else. So, ask Allah one more time. Ask Allah while you're certain that He'll give you. And some people ask and just, uh, yeah Allah, khalas, just, just, I'm just saying this, huh? I, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but I'm saying it, yeah. And then the heart is somewhere else. They want, he wants to leave. He wants to go. He wants, just let me say it. So, it, you know. but you, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't respond from a heart like this. That's heedless. That's not even paying attention. You have to be with Allah. Yeah? And you're paying attention with Allah. And you're certain that Allah will respond to you. So this is from the etiquettes of dua. And the, the, the scholars say you make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal in the time of difficulty and in the time of ease. So it's not like in the time of, of, of difficulty you're calling upon Allah and it's a familiar voice in the heavens, your voice. And then in the time of ease, you're like, everything is okay. And why should I ask him? I don't have a problem. So that's the only time you run to Allah when there's a problem? How would you feel if you have a friend and they only run to you when they have a problem? Well, mashallah, what a loyal friend, what a good friend. Mashallah, I hope to see you again. Now you make dua, I hope to see you again. May you have another calamity. How would you feel if a friend only comes to you when they have a problem? Every, anytime you see him, I need this, I need it right here. Tabi Akhi, don't you ever just come to me and say salam or something or have a meal or... Just only when you have a problem, so with Allah Azza wa Jal, you ask as Subhanahu wa Taala, you ask Him, even if everything is okay. And imagine someone Allah blessed him and bestowed so many blessings on him that he says, "Well, everything is okay. Why should I make dua to Allah right now? Alhamdulillah, the kids are fine, the money is good, the house is good, my health is, everyone's health is all right. Why should I make dua? What an ungrateful person, right? Immediately you feel this person is ungrateful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Taib, why don't you make dua for Allah to keep the ni'ma upon you? Why don't you make dua to Allah to keep your children healthy, to guide them in the future, to keep them muhtadeen, to, to keep the health upon you, to, keep your, to preserve your wealth and so on, to put barakah in your, your wealth. Does there have to be a problem before you run to Allah Azza wa Jal? And for that reason then, the scholars say from the etiquette of dua is that you make dua to Allah with ikhlas, just like we saw in that hadith. 
that with ikhlas, you're asking Allah and you're asking Allah alone, and you're sincerely asking and requesting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the etiquettes of dua is that you begin with alhamd and uh, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So you can even say, there's no fixed way, but you can say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alim. And you can keep making any salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And you're asking Allah, like we said, and you are certain, you have ikhlas, and you're certain that Allah Azza wa Jal will respond to you. And you persevere. Many people, they make dua once, twice, three times, uh, where is it? It's not here, طيب, خلاص. it's not working. Persevere, the scholars say, when you want something from Allah, ask the same way a child asks from a parent. And you, <laughs> living here, you've seen, when at the store a child wants a piece of candy, and the ch parent says no. And the worst akhlaq now and the crying and rolling on the floor and pleading and begging and everything comes out of the child at that moment. The scholars liken it to that. Beg Allah like that. Cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him again and again and again and cry and beg and ask Allah azza wa jal. Some people just one time, two times, three times. Where is it? It didn't come. Yalla, khalas, it's not working. Maybe our sins, maybe something blocked it. La, I think your impatience blocked it. And because of impatience, say our brothers and sisters, because of impatience, so many people, they, instead of persevering and constantly asking Allah, they go look for shortcuts. They try to find some other way to do it. And that's why we have, in many Muslim countries, all these formulas for, and these magical du'as to, for something to happen quickly. One of the ones I always quote is, to, and طبعا, this is all nonsense, we we'll make sure no one forgets now and thinks that we're saying this. For example, they say you recite Al-Fatiha a thousand times in one night and whatever you want will happen. And the good news is people who try that, they fall asleep before they finish reciting Al-Fatiha a thousand times. Maybe someone can calculate that. How long does it take to recite Al-Fatiha once? Multiply that by a thousand. Is it even possible to do that in one night or not? And if there was a formula like that, would anyone have a problem? And that's why these books, these little formula books, so popular, so popular amongst the, the believers. And if you say this, you will always have bread. Well, like this for formula for bread, formula for ma'arif, money never running out, formula for people respecting you, formula for people never insulting you. And the Prophet ﷺ was insulted. Don't you think he would have used this formula, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? People are insulting Allah Azza wa Jal. And who are you? You're going to say something 64 times and khalas, uh, no one's going to touch you. Go push someone in the street, he turns around to you. You, I, I can't insult you. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I always tell you, how I was, we had this booklet, and it has the names of Allah. And each one, if you say this many times, some miraculous thing would happen. And remember looking through that book. I look through this one, if you say it, you will always have bread. I look through the next one, no one will insult you. Next one. They tell you, you know, you will never become poor. Next one, your wife will obey you. Next one, oh, wait a minute, let me. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll try this one only. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so people have become impatient. In Muslim countries, people run quickly to, to the sorcerer. And it's impermissible, it's severely haram. They run to the sorcerer. They need a quick fix. We're used to, every, to instant gratification, everything happening quickly. لا. Not with Allah Azza wa Jal. You keep asking Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep begging Him and crying to Him. And you ask Allah Azza wa Jal in any language you, you want. In any language you speak. Huh? Any language you speak, ask Allah in it. And don't allow someone to restrict the relationship between you and Allah. I'm sitting in the doctor's office, can I make dua to Allah in my language? Yes or no? Hesitation or are you being British? I know British people are very reserved, so which one is it? Are you hesitating or are you being British? British. Being British, excellent. So you know you can make dua to Allah in any language. I'm at the doctor's office and I'm waiting. I, ya Allah, I swear to speak to Allah Azza wa Jal in Urdu, in Tagalog, in Hindi, in Mandarin, in any language I make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? The scholars say because one, you're eloquent in your language. Maybe I have, maybe even if I know some Arabic, Maybe I'm not able to, in classical Arabic to translate and say everything. Maybe you, someone has a, a, an exam in mencular physics. How do you translate mencular physics into classical Arabic? It's impossible. You know why? 
Because there's no such thing as mencular physics. I made it up. <laughs> That's one reason. <laughs> What are you going to have to go through a tarjama book every time? And, okay, this is what I'm going to say. Write out the dua. So when you're in your sujood, you have a cheat sheet. You put the sheet there, make sujood on it, and read Allahumma. What did I write there? Allah, Allahumma. In your language, you ask Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? And the scholars say, so one, you're more eloquent. Two, your heart is there. True or false? Your heart is there. You know what you're saying. And you have your own specific, and yeah, this is your custom dua. You know, you, you want just a regular generic du'a or your custom du'a. Now I, want, I have cu my custom problems, I want a custom du'a for it. I want some guy to give me a piece of paper, this is du'a, go say it. Type, okay, some of the stuff in this du'a doesn't apply to me. You know, giving me children and stuff, I'm not even married yet. I don't need this right now, maybe in the future, yeah. But and don't give me custom, give me these generic du'as. I, I have custom problems, I need to customize my own du'a. Don't let someone come between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. So in any language you can call upon your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah Azza wa from the etiquettes three times. Ask Allah three times. You know, Allahumma rzuqna al-jannah, Allahumma rzuqna al-jannah, Allahumma rzuqna al-jannah, well, anything. Whatever you want to ask Allah, ask three times is from the etiquette. And facing the qibla also is from the etiquette of making dua. Facing the qibla is a sunnah and it's not wajib. It's a sunnah and it's not wajib. Yani I can make dua to Allah in any position. But if, especially if I want to make a long du'a and I'm preparing for it, then here it would be preferable to make wudu, for example. I want to sit down and make long du'a. I, it doesn't have to be that long. Making wudu is preferable. Facing the qibla is preferable. But I can be in any position. I don't have to pull out. I see this only in the UK. The guys pull out their phones and start going like this. Then it tells them the qibla. So I'm on the bus. I'm going like that. And I have to turn that way. Then the bus turns like, now which way is it? Khalas, <laughs> just make du'a at this point, right? So, the, where, so where do we know this from? يعني, the companions described in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, ثُمَّ اسْتَقْبَلَ الْقِبْلَ فَدَعَى ثُمَّ اسْتَقْبَلَ الْقِبْلَ فَدَعَى Then he turned towards the Qibla and he made Dua. From the etiquette of Dua is not raising the voice, yelling out loud and screaming out loud. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told the companions, you're not calling one that is mute or far or, or absent. You don't have to yell like that for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to hear you. From the etiquette of dua is that you, you might begin by admitting your sin. You're not arrogant in front of Allah and Allah knows what you conceal and what you reveal and He knows the sins that you committed. So you can admit the sin that you made and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive it. Acknowledge all the blessings that you have from Allah. And this is part of your etiquette of beginning this discussion or, or this speaking to Allah. So you acknowledge your sins. I'm not trying to cover them up or make excuses for them. And sometimes people constantly will make excuses for their sins. Oh, this is okay, the heart is pure, and this is alright, and this is difference of opinion. And this is three opinions on it. لا. Admit it now with Allah Azza wa Jal. And acknowledge all the blessings that you have from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you raise the hands from the etiquettes of dua. And the advantages we said, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates to return, return them sifratain, يعني, empty. So from the etiquettes is to put your hands up. Because... The scholars say, and as an example, I might ask, or someone might ask you, and he'll put his hand out like this, and say, please give me. And you might let them return their hand empty-handed. Some people might do that. Allah Kareem, you know, another time. And they'll put their hand back empty-handed. But Allah doesn't like to do that. Allah hates to do that, or it's, it's shy to do that. Dislikes to do that. So, Put your hands up so that when you're, they're returned, Allah gives you in one of the three situations that we mentioned, either in the dunya or pushing, giving you a similar good or pushing away a similar harm or giving it to you in the akhirah. So from the etiquettes of making dua to raise your hands. Do you have to raise your hands all the time? La, we're saying from the etiquettes. We didn't say from the wajibat or the shurut or the arkan. Yani just from the etiquette. So you can be at the doctor's office and you can just make dua. Maybe your hands are in your pocket and you're making dua as you're sitting in the chair there. And you don't have to do this in front of everybody. It's okay, Yani. Um, the, uh, the scholars say when you make dua, don't make i'tida. I'tida is basically transgressing and going over the boundaries. Is it time to stop? <coughs> Nam? Oh, okay, time. Um, do not. I'tida is, is transgressing in, when making dua. For example, to make dua for something that would never happen, or it's an impossibility. Ya Allah, make me a prophet. Type, you know there's not going to be a prophet anymore. 
Oh Allah, make me a Sahabi. Make me from the Sahaba, ya Allah. Tab, khalas, it's over, Habibi. You missed that chance. There was no chance even. Either you were born a Sahabi or not. يعني. So you can't make a dua for something that's impossible. And don't make a dua with too many details. Oh Allah, give me a house. And just as I lived in southeastern London, give me a house in southeastern part of the Jannah. Okay? <laughs> or give me, Ya Allah, a tree this high, with this many branches, with this many birds on it. Then here, this is i'tida. You're going, oh, you're overstepping. You're, just uh, <laughs> say, ask Allah to go in, taban, to go to Jannah al-Firdos. Prophet also taught us to aim high. Yani, no one makes dua, oh Allah, make me that guy in the hadith, the last one to leave the hellfire. And first he waits outside, and then he goes inside. Because that guy gets ten times from the kings of the dunya. Oh, that's good. La Habibi, makes you. Nabi Sallallahu taught you, if you make dua, make dua for al-firdaus al-a'la, the highest level of al-jannah. Don't aim low. So, too many details. And sometimes the sisters would ask a question like this. Can I make dua to Allah to marry me on the day of judgment, in, in, the, in jannah, to marry me to a specific sahabi? I know, it's a question that has come before. Yani. No, you can't. Oh, Ya Allah, make me one of the wives of Bilal ibn Rabah fil Jannah. You can't do that. Maybe they'll give you Ali, Ali Shamusha, Shamusha or whatever his name is. Just some guy from Northeast London. Let's pick up Northeast London. Okay? So don't, too many details. And you don't make dua for something that already happened. Something already. Ya Allah, yani, I don't know. You can use your imagination. Yani. Something that already happened, yeah? Ya Allah, يعني, well, I don't know. I was going to say, Ya Allah, give me, a, wed, give me a wife and you're already married. But that's a valid dua, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can use your imagination and think of an example. Oh Allah, يعني, create me in this dunya. طب ما خلاص, you're already in the dunya. <laughs> so it's already happened. You don't make dua like this. You don't go. You also don't say, inshallah in the dua. And you, oh, in shit. You're not asking Allah like that, yeah? We said, يعني, الجزم, يعني, and you're, in, you're, you're certain and you're يعني, almost insistent in the dua. You're persistent and insistent when you're asking Allah. So you're not saying, يعني, oh Allah, يعني, take me to Jannah, insha'Allah. And he take me to Jannah if you will, يعني, if you decide. Now, what are you saying? If you don't decide, throw me over there, what are you saying then? So you say, Ya Allah, يعني, you don't say insha'Allah or in shit. It's like يعني, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, يعني, we're okay. لا. So it's no in, no in shit and insha'Allah and stuff in dua. It's not from the etiquette of dua. The scholars say from the etiquette is that you start from yourself. You start with yourself. Yeah? You start always with yourself and then someone else. And with some, a lot of times with issues of deen, you don't give preference to someone else over yourself. Just like sometimes there'll be a gap in the front row. And brothers will like, you know, he'll advance and he'll move back and like, do you go? Yeah, I don't need this reward at the front row. <laughs> MashaAllah, I do a qiyamah. <laughs> I'm fasting also, by the way. <laughs> you don't do things like that. Also, sometimes you find people leave the front row for another person, you know. <laughs> Maulana came. Maulana came late. Khalas, Maulana pray in the fourth row. This guy leaves the front row. Maulana, come. <laughs> no, Habibi, you pray in the front row. You be Maulana this time. Pray in the front row. Yeah? Um, so you start with yourself. The scholars say, look, يعني, look at the dua in the Quran. How, how fantastic is that? Oh, my Lord, forgive me and forgive my parents. You love your parents and even here the dua says, forgive me and then my parents. So you make dua for yourself and then you make dua for your friends, for family, for whatever it is. طيب. Um, you don't lose hope when making dua. You don't lose hope when asking Allah. And sometimes you see people who lose hope. يعني, you tell someone comes and he's sick. Make dua, inshallah, Allah will, will heal you. Oh, la la, it's, uh, it's khalas, it went stage four. What do you mean? It went, the, the doctor can't heal stage four. But Allah can heal stage four. Make dua. La la, he's been sick 20 years. Dua, what, what dua? What do you mean, what dua? Make dua, ya khi, don't lose hope. The guy tells you, oh, it's, been, oh, it's too late now. Too late for whom? We're talking about Allah Azza wa What too late now? Some people are like that. Or a man that can't have children for 20 years, you know, make, tell, make dua to Allah. No, no, we've been to all doctors. It's been 20 years. This is a long issue. يعني, خلاص. خلاص what? Make dua to Allah Azza wa <coughs> Who's to stop Allah if you will have a child? The scholars say, look at Zakaria. Alayhi salam. Zakaria, his wife, he said, وَمْرَأَتِي عَاقِرِ عَاقِرِ يعني إيش? Sterile. 
His wife was sterile. Forget the fact that she was old. Yani the scholars say, if she was 20 years old, she still couldn't get pregnant because she's sterile. Now she's sterile and old. Isn't that amazing or what? Are you amazed? Amazed and British? As long as I know you're amazed, even internally if you're amazed, it's fine with me. Okay, because I'm used to audiences that jump up in America. <laughs> so you guys, any Egyptians in here? You gotta love Egyptians. Agda, Nas. Love Egyptians, man. Because they jump, man. They jump. Maybe the Sheikh has been too Britishized now. Britishized. But see, you listen to an Egyptian lecture, man, you hear people react. Allah Akbar. <laughs> Anyways, but I respect how you guys are composed and respectable, dignified. That's very good, fine with me. But I think it's a jump worthy point that his wife was sterile and old. If she was just sterile, she would still, it would still be impossible. But he's still making dua to Allah for a child. Did he lose hope? Ab thank you, sir. Absolutely not. Did not lose hope. Um, one of the things that make your dua responded to is that you, you have a lot of halal. Taban, halal in everything. Eating halal, meaning you don't eat haram here. I mean, taban, here people <laughs> see this hadith is for zabiha meat. <laughs> No, eating halal meat meaning not eating haram, okay? Not eating anything that's haram. It doesn't, it doesn't mean just meat. Could be, tomato can be haram. How can a tomato be haram? If you steal it, yeah? If you steal it, it's haram. Walk into, uh, what's your store? Asda, yeah? Clean one up and just eat it. <laughs> we don't have to worry about the biha here, so khalas, halal. <laughs> no, it's not, Habibi, no, it's not. So, make sure that in the hadith, Nabi Wasallam is describing a man وَمَأْكَلُهُ يعني He's asking Allah, asking Allah, asking Allah and his food, مَأْكَلُهُ حَرَام وَمَشْرَبَهُ حَرَام and his drink is حَرَام وَمَلْبَسَهُ حَرَام and his clothing is حَرَام فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ يعني From where is he going to get a response? Eats حَرَام, drinks حَرَام, dresses حَرَام and he wants Allah to respond to him? Where is he going to get this response from? So keeping everything halal and the Prophet ﷺ gave the advice, he said أَطِبْ مَطْعَمَكْ أَطِبْ and keep your food good, يعني clean, halal, pure, of, you know, of pure wealth and things of that sort. أطيب مطعمك From the etiquettes of dua is that you don't make dua against others. You don't make dua against other believers, okay? And it's not really, يعني, unless طبعاً, there's an enemy, but you don't just like, you know, see a, a non-Muslim walking the street. Oh Allah. <laughs> I couldn't even keep a straight face, yeah? Oh Allah, thunder right now on his head, Ya Allah. <laughs> Why, Akhi? Wouldn't you rather, if you put your hands up for anonymous, wouldn't you rather they be guided? I think, right? You'd, be, you'd rather they're, they're guided. So, not making dua against others. Wallahi, I. Uh, يعني, there was, uh, there was this, in this office, يعني, without much details, يعني, but the person told me they were to work at an office with the, in a Muslim country. And this woman. Uh, they, they had the boss, يعني, was basically the boss was whatever, mean or un, unkind at the office. And suddenly he died. When he died, one of the co-workers told them, Wallahi, for two years after every salah, I make dua for Allah to kill him. <laughs> and she is very happy. He died because of my dua, I killed him. يعني, you could, يعني, haram, haram, يعني, haram. He has children, he has a wife, he has a family, he has brothers and sisters, he has a mother that loves him. Why would you do something like that? It's because of work, because of the printer, the phone, silly things like that. Two years every sujood. And this, by the way, this is one of the signs of the hypocrites, that they're severe if they have a disagreement with you. Severe. For the believers, don't be like that. Be very merciful and gentle to the believers, even if you have a problem with them. Wallahi, there was, uh, uh, and this happened in America, there was a hafiz, a qari, okay, as you say hafiz, right? A qari. And he had a small issue with another uh, Muslim businessman. And it was a small issue, wallahi, it was an issue of misunderstanding. Wonderful, that's all I need. An issue of misunderstanding, yeah? And this businessman said, wallahi, every sujood I make dua against him. Ya Khitayb, do you make every, in every sajda, do you make dua against George Bush? This was George Bush time. If anything, at least, يعني, who's worse, يعني, this, this qari, this gentle يعني, man who memorized the book of Allah, and you're going to dedicate a section of every sajda to him? But at least if you're going to do that, I know some of you think, maybe, well, I don't think any of you will think, uh, make even good dua for Bush. 
But at least if you're going to dedicate a section of your du'a to make against someone, I have a long list of people before some righteous man in our community. I can give you, if you need help, I'll give you a list of kuffar and tyrants and people who need some serious du'a against them. <laughs> Pick this guy. So this is one of the attributes and the descriptions of the hypocrites that they're shadid, if there is a difference, if they, they disagree or have an altercation with someone, they're severe, they can't control it. So it's not from the way of the believer to make dua against others. Or to make dua, oh Allah give us, give, and it's to say, oh Allah give me my punishment in the akhirah here in the dunya. And then there, there's a hadith where a man went to, the uh, Prophet went to this man who was bedridden, and he said, what kind of dua did you make? The Prophet felt this man would make the wrong dua. He said, what kind of dua did you make? So the man tells him, I used to make dua for Allah to give me my punishment in the akhirah here in the dunya. The Prophet told him, don't say that. It would have been better for you to say, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasana. Yani if you're going to make dua to Allah, and if he's going to answer you anyways, Oh Allah, give us the best in this dunya and the best in the akhirah. Doesn't that make more sense? Oh Allah, give me my punishment there here. Tabu, how about Allah, don't give me punishment there. Yani at least even that's better, isn't it? Um, uh, طيب, just as an ib, يعني, and you don't make dua for something that's haram. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, please help me murder this person. Ya Allah, <laughs> oh, Ya Allah, help me get drunk tonight. يعني, these things are haram. You can't make dua for, to help, for Allah to help you with something that's haram. And <laughs> we have to say this. يعني, I know you're thinking, well, this is silly. Like you have to, the scholars mention it. And sometimes people will make dua for something that's haram. They want to go meet someone for something haram. Ya Allah, facilitate. So, and but as a point of interest, يعني, wiping over the face, it's a weak hadith. يعني, when you make dua, and then you wipe the face. It's a weak hadith that you wipe the face. So you don't wipe the face. We don't worship Allah based on weak hadith. But sometimes you say this hadith and people are so used to wiping the face, they don't know what to do. One time we said this in a masjid and we said it. So after the salah, Allah, I noticed some people, they finished, then they were about to wipe, then they, look, then they went like this. <laughs> so what are you wiping? <laughs> There's nothing there really <laughs> that you're putting here or anything. But khalas, it's over, it's over. There's nothing, no one, nothing to... You walk around like this to the bathroom, wash your hands. <laughs> Taib, the times where the du'a is accepted and we have like three minutes, the time when your du'a is accepted, the last third of the night. The last third of the night is the most magnificent time and Allah is asking, who wants to be forgiven? Who is asking? Who is seeking forgiveness so I may forgive him? And who is asking for something so I may give him? And in this time we are in deep, deep, deep sleep. People who have a problem, they get up in the last third of the night and it's like, a treasure chest. You put your hands in and you take what you want. Allah Azza wa will give you. Just wake up and ask Him. How do we calculate the last third of the night? Let's make the math easy. Maghrib is at 6 o'clock. This is hypothetically. Taban, you guys, <laughs> yani for you, Isha is at 2 in the morning. Yeah? And Fajr is at 1.15 before it. <laughs> your times are, mashallah, very strange here. Al Muhim, let's say in this simple example, Maghrib is at 6 o'clock. And Fajr is at 6 o'clock. So how many hours is this night we have? 12 hours. If I break it into thirds, then it will be increments of 4 hours. So the last third of the night will be at? Yeah, 2 o'clock. Fantastic, in this example. And then you calculate it. Look at what time Maghrib is, what time, uh, I mean, yeah, Maghrib and Fajr. See how long that night is. Break it into three. And that last third is when Allah descends and asks those magnificent questions. And you ask Allah if you get up at that time, if you have a problem, and you'll get your solution. Making dua at times of rain, it's a yeah, higher chance of your dua being accepted. Making dua when traveling, making dua on the day of Al Jumu'ah, Friday. Making dua when you're in your sujood. The Prophet said, You're closer to Allah when you're in your sujood. So make dua in, you're in your sujood. Making dua while fasting. And, and dua at the time of fast. Yani when you're breaking the fast, uh, sorry, the breaking fast. The time you're breaking the fast, you have uh, a dua with Allah that will not be refused and so on and so forth and many other examples. Yani, but inshallah with that from at least we'll take the, the, the notion of wanting to constantly make dua to Allah and also make dua to, for your brothers because the angel will say Ameen wa laka mithluh and Ameen and for you the, the likes of the same yani, that you've made the dua for. I'd like to thank you for being an excellent and attentive audience and thank you for coming. Sallallahu wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.